Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be back, back with you all um, for the Augustine College Summer Program. Of course, this is a very unusual way for us to be together, and I hope that we're able to make the best of it um, and learn something together in reflecting on St. Augustine's Confessions. I understand that once you've had an opportunity to watch this video, um, that we will be gathering by Zoom to have a discussion on June 11th. And I trust you'll feel free to bring your questions and comments and anything that you've learned from whichever portion of the confessions you've been able to read um, or anything else that you'd like to talk about that's related to, to it in some way to St. Augustine. I will be happy to um, welcome you to the discussion. I'd like to begin with a uh, prayer. This is one of the most famous passages of the Confessions, and probably anybody who's heard of the text has heard this passage. Late have I loved you, beauty so old and so new. Late have I loved you. And see you were within, and I was in the external world and sought you there. And in my unlovely state, I plunged into those lovely created things which you made. You were with me, and I was not with you. And we'll continue uh, by actually singing something together. Um, I want to share this with you. This is uh, a, obviously a prayer that uh, we all know, the Lord's Prayer in Latin, and St. Augustine would have known it and prayed it in Latin and may well have sung it to this melody um, or a very similar melody. We begin, um, I begin my classes at the college with the students uh, with this prayer. Pater noster qui es in celis, sanctificetur nomen tuum, adveniat regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, sicut in celo et in terra, panem nostrum quotidianum da nobis odium. Et dimite nobis te vita nostra, sicut et nos dimitimus te vitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentazione, sed libera nos amore. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, we have about an hour and a little bit more perhaps to work with according to the um, stipulations that I've been given by Corey. And so I'd like to proceed in three parts. The first two rather short, uh, just a brief introduction to his life and times, uh, some key ideas of the thinker who we're considering today, and then the bulk of the presentation will be on uh, the confessions. So, St. Augustine, a father of the church for both East and West, and especially for the West. He is certainly the most influential single theologian in Western Christianity, whether you are Catholic or Protestant, um, perhaps less so for the Free Church Protestants, but certainly very explicitly important for those in the Reformed tradition, as well as for Lutherans and Anglicans. Indeed, one can say that his influence is there throughout Western Christian theology. It's as if St. Augustine gives the uh, Lego blocks that people will use, even when they construct uh, different structures with them, they're using some of the basic blocks that he has laid out, some of the concepts and ideas uh, that Augustine um, first introduced um, through his writings. He is also honored in the Orthodox churches, but to a lesser extent, and his writings were never received or read uh, there in the same measure. You will have heard of On Christian Teaching, um, The City of God, On the Trinity, but of course it is the Confessions that we're looking at this evening that is his most famous text. You might also enjoy, for some summer reading, um, his uh, commentary on the Psalms. That's one of the most evocative texts in my estimation. A very beautiful um, treatment of uh, that part of scripture that he would have prayed most assiduously, um, as his, was the custom um, throughout the church, to pray the Psalter at several times a day, portions of the Psalter, and indeed to pray through the, the Psalter, entire Psalter, in the course of a week. <clears throat> 
and he has um, a lot of really interesting things to say about the Psalms, and like many other church fathers, finds in the Psalms a veritable compendium of the gospel itself. St. Augustine was born and died in what's today in North Africa. There are still ruins um, in uh, Tunis, in the suburb of Tunis, such as Carthage, uh, where he went to school, uh, and in Hippo, um, where he was from, and to which he returned to serve as bishop, which is today in Algeria. Of course, uh, these countries have long been Islamic, but they preserve through the archaeology a memory of not only a Christian past, but also of the pre-Christian Roman past. His mother was a Christian, Monica. We hear a lot about her in the text. And his father was a pagan, although baptized on his deathbed. In some ways, Augustine's family background can be seen as a, as a metaphor for how he brings together worlds of discourse. That is, he brings together the Christian theology, the Judeo-Christian tradition, present in the scriptures, and he marries it to Greek philosophy, particularly that of the Neoplatonists. And there's always been this dialectic between uh, the Semitic tradition and the Hellenic tradition, we might say, in Christianity. And we see that even already in the Gospel of John, of course, where Christ is introduced as the Logos. St. Augustine was converted in Milan, Italy, through the ministry of St. Ambrose. And St. Ambrose, of course, is very prolific as well. Many, many homilies that we have in treatises by him. And both of them are witnesses in that respect to the early church, uh, the church, church of the first few centuries. And at that time of transition when the church, uh, when Christianity becomes legal and the church begins to um, engage in the public square in a more formal way. He turned some his remarkable rhetorical skills to pastoral ends, and that's indeed why we have so many texts by Augustine that have survived. Indeed, some things have been lost. Um, countless homilies, as well as the extended theological treatises, treatises to which I referred earlier. Um, it's fair to say that Augustine is not only the most important uh, single figure in Western Christianity, but he is the one about whom the most has been written. One could easily fill a library with the works simply by Augustine and about him um, by others. He bridges the classical and medieval worlds. He lives at the twilight of the Roman Empire uh, and is a seminal um, figure for the emergence of medieval Latin Christendom, who will look to him, as I've said, as the preeminent doctor of the faith. He also occupies a very significant place in the history of philosophy per se. It's characteristic of Western Christianity that there has been a cultivation of philosophy and theology as two distinct, not separate, but distinct uh, disciplines. And one could study St. Augustine even without faith, um, coming to it, that is, without a not from a perspective of faith, if one were interested in questions of um, hermeneutics, of semiotics, of uh, the, the way in which we read texts, um, the art of interpretation, questions about the philosophy of time, for example, also the nature of selfhood, um, as well as uh, 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 philosophical ethics, for example, and uh, political philosophy. All of these uh, domains of philosophy are things to which Augustine has contributed uh, above and beyond uh, and sometimes through his work in theology. Some key ideas, and I say some because of course there's far more than we can treat in tonight's presentation. One would certainly be the role of illumination in coming to truth. That is, Augustine comes to believe that we only know what we know because the Holy Spirit enables us to know from within. Our reason, which is a powerful tool, um, not least in, in possession of someone like St. Augustine, is nonetheless fallen and prone to delusion. And therefore, it is only when God illumines us from within that we are able to have a correct understanding of him as of ourselves. Indeed, for Augustine, it's only through divine illumination that we're able to have a correct understanding even of the world around us, not simply of spiritual matters, but of all knowledge. 
in that sense, he is um, does not espouse the idea of a, a free or supreme or sovereign reason, hmm? uh, such as we might see with enlightenment figures who come much later in the Western tradition, but rather um, the dependence of the human person upon divine grace. He has a lot to say about the interpretation of scripture. I've already mentioned his Enarationis, his commentary on the Psalms. And a very short uh, text uh, that we attend to give a presentation on when we have a student for a day uh, in the spring semester is his On Christian Teaching, also known as On Christian Doctrine, De Doctrina Cristiana, where he explores the art of interpretation. One of the first people to do so with respect to the Bible, what is necessary uh, to interpret the scriptures, what skills do we have to have, what things do we have to look out for, what principles or rules are there to be followed, um, and how does the interpretation of scripture uh, translate into Christian spirituality, Christian ethics. Uh, these are some of the things he explores there. The human soul is the image of the Trinity. A number of the early church fathers were concerned to explicate and defend the emerging Christian doctrine of the Trinity. Of course, the word Trinity is not in the Bible, even if the truths um, reflected in that term are, but it fell to the early fathers of the church to explain how God could be both one and three. St. Augustine's somewhat unique uh, way of doing this, um, he had a few different metaphors that he used, but uh, one was to see the human soul as the image of the Trinity. Why? Because we are able to have a colloquy with ourselves. We're able to, to think to ourselves um, about our thoughts without being schizoid or um, in some way um, having some kind of split personality. Um, and that ability to be a community within oneself, to have a thought and then to think about that thought and then to think about what one thought about that thought, so to speak, to go back and forth in one's mind. Um, this for him is very evocative. It's as if we understand ourselves as another. There's a very famous uh, text by the modern philosopher Paul Ricoeur called One Self as Another, indeed. And this uh, idea that, the, that w one could be one and many at the same time is, um, is expressed in our ability to converse with ourselves, within ourselves. There's also the idea here that um, we remember the past, we are conscious of the present, and we have an intention towards the future. And that ability to oscillate in different modalities of time for him is also uh, an image of our, uh, or a sign of our being made in the image of God. He associates memory with the Father, consciousness with the Son, and intention with the Spirit. Another image he uses is that the Holy Spirit is the bond of love between the Father and the Son. That is, in as much as the first epistle of St. John teaches us that God is love, um, we can think that within God there must be community as well, because love by its very nature requires a lover, a beloved, and then the love which is exchanged between the two. And for Augustine, the Holy Spirit fill this role of the, of the love uh, and therefore helped in, could help us understand how God could be um, within himself love, even apart from the presence of um, uh, other beings, angels or human beings, what have you. You will probably have heard of his, Augustine's views on grace uh, and his debate with Pelagius, who wanted to stress the role of human will, of human freedom in the process of sanctification. Augustine uh, rather stresses what will come to be called original sin. Again, not a, not a word that's in the Bible, but that picks up on many of the uh, many texts in the Bible. Um, in sin my mother bore me, right? Psalm 51, for example, and all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans, etc. Uh, for Augustine, this sin is there right from the get-go, and therefore it compromises even what we think are our best uh, intentions. 
and even our, our best efforts at drawing close to God. Uh, and therefore, it prevenient grace is required. God has to grant his grace even for us to come to a recognition of our fallenness. And God has to then have us uh, uh, give us, as it were, more grace to sustain us in that, uh, in turning to him. And then indeed sanctifying grace to actually make us holy once we have begun that uh, journey of repentance. This will lead to very um, vociferous debate in the Western church. Uh, that is where the priority of grace over free will. How do those two work together? And not least in the 16th century uh, reformations, there will be debate between Protestants and Catholics and among Protestants as well about this uh, on this topic. Curiously, it does not really arise in the Eastern church for some reason. They fight about a lot of things, but they don't fight about this. People generally following uh, the lead of um, St. Paul in the Galatians, where he says, work out your salvation um, with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and act according to his good purpose. Um, uh, St. Augustine also has a lot to say about uh, church and state, and this is something that becomes of great concern once the Christianity is legalized and Christians are permitted, in fact, to um, occupy and be involved in the public square, and therefore it becomes imperative for them to figure out how this is to be done. Um, and whether, to the, for example, Christians can serve in the military, what is the role of the military uh, and of government in the proposition or pot potentially even the imposition of the uh, Christian faith. I'm sorry, that was uh, Philippians, I meant to say earlier, uh, the Philippians 2.12, uh, uh, of course, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for God is the one who, for his good purpose, works in you both to desire and to work. follow in the vein of the church fathers who often quote uh, scripture uh, in a paraphrastic manner and uh, don't give their um, references uh, and sometimes get uh, texts a little bit confused. Um, uh, Augustine also has a lot to say about the divine efficacy of the sacraments. Of course, you don't have to agree with him on this any more than in anywhere else, um, but it's important that he presents arguments for how important baptism and Eucharist are, uh, and how they do not depend upon the worthiness of the holiness of the one uh, presiding or, or serving, celebrating uh, the sacraments. This emerged in a controversy with other Christians in North Africa, the Donatists, who felt that when a minister was guilty of serious sin, for example, of, of apostatizing, denying the faith, that they lost the ability to... Um, to serve God in that way, and that any sacraments that they performed, even baptism, uh, were not valid. People would have to be rebaptized because the baptism of someone who was such an egregious sinner could not be trusted. And here Augustine comes back again to the notion of the priority of grace, that because they're God's gifts, the sacraments, and God wants to give his own life in and through the sacraments, that they do not depend upon human beings. They make use of human beings, but they do not and finally, for this evening, I just want to mention um, Augustine, uh, later in his life, after his conversion, adopts a somewhat ascetic rule of uh, prayer, um, common life, um, devotion to, to, uh, to, to community and, and, and prayer in common, sharing of, of goods. Um, and this, uh, this rule, this rule of St. Augustine, leads to, uh, becomes basically the model for how clergy in the West up until around the 16th century will live in common. Clergy who are not in monasteries, but who are living in cathedrals, for example, in cities or in parishes. Um, and it, it begins something of a trend of a, a monasticization, we might say, of the clergy. Now, although this is, of course, greatly challenged and um, in some way deconstructed in the 16th century, um, one can see a certain return to this today, even uh, in, in Protestant circles, people are interested in the notion of a rule of life and adopting a, a spirituality having teeth, so to speak, having um, 
precepts that that are that, that guide a, a regimen um, of, of spiritual growth, uh, and in this they are drawing on a very uh, long legacy. The Renaissance looked to Augustine's intellectual and mystical interest, the Reformation to his emphasis on sin and grace, the Catholic Church to the many ecclesial themes in his writings, Descartes and his followers to his turn inward and his rational proofs. The city of God is interpreted to support a Christian state, the political realism that relies on power and a secular state with limited aims and space for religious freedom. In other words, Augustine provides a little bit of everything, something for everyone, we might say. Uh, and if this is your first time engaging with him, then I think it will not be your last. Man for all seasons is, of course, a term we usually uh, use to refer to St. Thomas More, but I think we could equally apply it here to St. Augustine, this lovely quote from uh, the editors of a book called A Reader's Guide to the Confessions. Augustine has filled a great many roles for his readers over the centuries, saint, sinner, bishop, son, father, theologian, philosopher, Platonist, Christian, Manichae, rhetorician, autobiographer, polemicist, apologist, exegete, mystic, misogynist, ascetic, Centralist. He was definitely several of these at any one time, arguably all of them, and which of these one regards as the author of the Confessions would greatly influence how one reads the books individually or together. So I invite you to think about that as you're reading. Um, what kind of person are you? What kind of role do you have? And how will it shape what you see in Augustine and indeed what you see in yourself as you read this text? Now, we often think that our relationship with God is something so intimate um, and personal that it is to be kept secret. Right? Many people are not comfortable speaking about the relationship with God with others. Um, and so one could ask right off the get-go, from the get-go, why would Augustine publish these innermost thoughts? It was not exactly a, a common thing to do. Um, when you were writing a text, you in the ancient world, you were not necessarily and, and very infrequently, in fact, would you be sort of disclosing your, your in almost thoughts. Um, one does not find other church fathers who have this degree of candor and transparency. They're writing about scripture, their homilies or catechesis or treatises on dogmatic questions, um, liturgical texts, poems, letters, um, but the confession stands as, as unique in this respect. God already knew Augustine's thoughts, his inmost thoughts, and we are outside, almost like, like uh, it's the kind of voyeurism, I might say, reading someone else's love letters. Well, he actually did think about you, maybe not you exactly, but he thought about all those who would come after him, although he could, surely could not have imagined there would be, you know, how many centuries of readers would, would come in his wake. But he says, I declare this, what he's about to say in the Confessions, to my race, to the human race, that only a tiny part can light on this composition of mine. Well, actually, the Confessions has been through countless translations and, and, and editions, and so many, many people have in fact lit upon his composition. Um, but it's important that he, that we understand that he is writing with a sense that it is somewhat unusual to disclose these innermost thoughts, and yet he feels there would be some you know, salvific benefit, sort of evangelizing benefit for all of us to hear his journey, to hear his testimony, we might say. And that's why I've called this lecture from testimony to tradition. There's his experience, his testimony, and then there's his handing it on, right? Uh, his passing it down, which is the meaning of the word tradition, that which is passed on. And he has passed it on, um, and, and it's come down to us, and now we are, as it were, passing it. I am passing it on to you. And in our discussion, we will be passing, as it were, passing the ball around as we think with Augustine about um, some very important uh, questions. Now, an autobiographer generally considers his own life to be of sufficient interest to share with his contemporaries. Otherwise, he would wait for a biographer to come along and, and write about his life. So the fact that Augustine is writing about his own life um, says that he understands his life is, is important um, or that there's something that we can learn from it. And yet it's not like most autobiographies. There's a whole lot of things that are left out. And 
I think we can say that he's not just interested in sharing with us his life, but he's interested in helping us discover our own. Right? He, it, we have our own confessions, as it were, to recount. We have our own story, and Augustine is going to, through his story, um, inspire us to examine and understand and even share our own. Now, Confessions is perhaps an odd title because it's actually not just a rehearsal of faults. He does tell us a lot about his sins, for sure. But that's not the only thing he's doing, and I don't think it's the most important thing he's doing. Certainly, books 10, 11, 12, and 13 are not about his faults at all. Indeed, books 1 to 9 were often printed, um, copied, and, and then later printed on their own um, because they form a unit, sort of a, an autobiographical unit, books 1 to 9. Books 10, 11, 12, 13 are a very different genre, and they almost could have been published, uh, they almost could be taken as two different books, and in fact were at, in, at, at some points in history. Um, all that to say that he has to choose what he will include in his autobiography, and it is highly selective. What do we see? We see him recounting the people and the events which are important in his conversion, right? the highlights and the lowlights, the things that mark out the uh, in chiaro scuro, the, the drama of his wandering from God and then his coming home. But all of this is recounted in the second person singular. That is, he's speaking to someone and it's not to us. It's to the Lord himself. So we can think of the confessions as, in fact, a long, long, very long prayer in which a prayer which recounts the story of his life and then his reflection, his mature reflection in the latter books on what he sees as some of the central mysteries of human experience, beauty and time, memory, death, um, friendship, so forth. Confession also in Latin means a profession of faith, like creed. It's what you believe and in whom you believe. And certainly the Confessions accomplishes this as well, reveals to us the faith of Augustine and the one in whom he believes. Now, the overarching theme of the book, as I've suggested, is humanity's relationship to God, seen through the prism of St. Augustine's life. It's about him, but it's not only about him. In fact, it's like his way of telling the story of Scripture. Scripture is mirrored in his life. Just as Scripture has Genesis, it has a revelation, right? it has a, a beginning and a consummation, and in between a story of a fall and a story of a wandering, a story of redemption, so too the confessions, as we'll see, in book one begins with his own origins, in book nine, the end of the autobiographical section, a kind of consummation of his life. And everything in between, the story of the economy of salvation in his, uh, in his particular experience. There's another story here too, and that is the story, the, the meta-narrative of Neoplatonic philosophy. Now, these were, this refers to a philosophical school that was very popular uh, in the early centuries of the church and which Augustine and many other church fathers exploit in order uh, to give a philosophical um, account of the truths that are otherwise explained in scripture. And they see a, a kind of a harmony of, of these narratives that scripture reveals in detail what Neoplatonic philosophy had in, intuited um, in a more abstract manner. And this, uh, to be very brief about it, there's the idea of the one, the one reality behind everything, um, which is simple, pure, good, the source of goodness, truth, and beauty. And the one comes forth into the multiplicity of the world. And uh, then uh, returns to itself 
an exitus and a reditus, this is a great arc or circle that the, the one makes. Uh, and we can choose how we want to participate in this dynamic, uh, this movement or not, whether we want to continue to, uh, away from the, the one or return to the one. And what Augustine sees is that this, this story of the exitus and reditus takes flesh, literally, in the incarnation of Christ, who is the one who comes forth from the bosom of the Father to gather up the brokenness, the fragmentation of creation, and lead us back to uh, the source, that is to the Father. Augustine throughout this text is concerned with questions of truth. Where do we find truth? How do we find it? How do we know when we found it? How do we know we're not deceived, deluded? To what extent do we attain truth um, through um, study, through debate even um, with others? And to what extent does it depend on a kind of work of grace, illumination? Mm -hmm. Um, to what extent, as it were, can we learn to swim on our own? And to what extent is, do we actually need someone to teach us? We see Augustine continually moving back and forth in this text between what he's learned and what he has come to see as certain, and then trying to go a little bit further, and then coming back and questioning, maybe things weren't as clear as he thought they were, right? truth that he thought he knew was perhaps not uh, the whole story after all. So he goes back and forth and at each, you know, at each um, moment in this dialectic, he is brought to realize the insufficiency of his human knowledge and yet the way in which God nonetheless uses whatever he knows to push him on to the next level. He is, like Socrates, a lover of wisdom, a philosopher, as I've already said. But unlike Socrates, he's a lover of people. And he's a lover of attention. And he's a lover of affection. And lover of all sorts of things that gets him into all sorts of trouble. He says, I was in love with being loved. And so we hear a lot about how difficult it is for him, and by extension for many other people, to both recognize the difference between good and evil, and then having recognized it to actually choose good rather than evil. He is a man who is mm, shaped by his heart as much as by his head, right? Someone has said that the longest road is from the head to the heart. And that would be a way actually of, of summarizing uh, the confessions too. Um, because even when he begins to understand um, intellectually that the gospel is true, uh, it takes a long time for him to be willing in his heart to embrace it and to change his life uh, accordingly. I said already that I think this book is really an invitation for each of us to consider our own story. God is present to Augustine in his particularity, and of course he's present to each of us in our own. How would you tell the story of your confessions if you were to write? If you were to write that story for others. In this story, the actual protagonist is not Augustine, but God. It's written to God, but Augustine is actually read, writing about God. He's writing about God's working in him and gradually drawing him to himself. So let's dive right in now to the, um, the actual uh, slides uh, dealing, uh, summarizing the different books of the Confessions. I will, I'm obviously leaving a number of things out in order to respect the time limit that we have. Um, but I hope this will give you at least a taste of uh, each of the of the books and uh, invite you to, to delve into them um, in whatever measure you are able, whether prior to our discussion next week or perhaps later on this summer. Book one, uh, Early Years, begins with the paradox of beginnings and the challenge of confessing to God. Augustine says, how can I 
tell you anything when I need to learn from you who I am. Right? He says, we come into this world, we don't even remember our own origin. Right? We learn about our, our life as an infant from other people. We can imagine it, but we generally don't have memories that go back that far. So we are thrown into this world and are um, trying to figure it out in medias res, right, in the middle of things as it goes along. And so Augustine here articulates a very um, a wonderful sort of enigma. Um, do we know God and then pray? Or do we pray in order to know God, right? What comes first? Or is it a, is it a chicken, chicken and egg thing, right? Um, we generally don't speak to somebody if we don't know them at some level. We certainly don't disclose very much to people just when we meet them as strangers. But unless we actually talk to somebody, we're never going to get to know them, right? Um, and so similarly here, Augustine says, how can we know you, Lord, when we actually need to learn from you who we are? It's like the, 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 the vulnerability of the soul is analogous to the vulnerability, the feebleness of the infant uh, who comes into this world and is given everything. Right from the get-go here, when he's speaking about his childhood, he is imagining, of course, not remembering, but he's imagining, based on how many other infants he's seen, that uh, infants are already little sinners, you know? When we see a baby, we're like, oh, how cute this Johnny is, or little Janie, or what have you. No, Augustine, when he sees a baby, he sees a little monster right? <laughs> who is just waiting to acquire the faculties to be able to... Um, uh, give free reign to the desires that are already there. And I invite us in the, uh, as we'll see in the discussion questions, to think about uh, what you as doctors especially know a lot about um, biology and you know more than probably the average person about sort of the nature nurture debate uh, and to what extent our um, pathologies of our you know, human condition, uh, our sins, um, are a function of our genes or of the way we are raised, or perhaps neither. He goes on to speak about his, uh, his childhood education and the way in which he was, he was punished. Corporal punishment, of course, was common then as it was throughout most of history. Um, and he resents that, right? He was, he was beaten and he felt that the, the masters um, were not only cruel, but hypocritical, that they were simply interested in people um, demonstrating a mastery of language, regardless of whether they were using that language to noble purposes. Of course, the real irony is that it's that very education that he received that enables Augustine to write so well. He is a master of the Latin language. He's very competent at, its, uh, at, at using poetic devices, metaphors and similes, word plays, pun and so forth, uh, that has made the Confessions of Joy to read for those people who are able to read it in the original. He concludes in this book that um, suffering, the suffering that he knew as a child, is used by God for his own purposes. By your laws we are disciplined from the canes of schoolmasters to the ordeals of martyrs. Your laws have the power to temper bitter experiences in a constructive way, recalling us to ourself, to yourself. We could ask, well, is this attempt at justifying God, theodicy, right? Uh, is it successful? Should we be doing this? Is it necessary to see suffering as redemptive? Or is it perhaps sometimes and not always? To what extent should we try to rationalize suffering? Book two is uh, very famous because it recounts his fall, the fall, we might say. Keep in mind what I said about St. Augustine telling, as it were, the story of the scriptures through the prism of his own life. Right? Here he is, um, on the one hand, um, indulging in you know, youthful concupiscence, um, fornication, a teenager. Um, he was given a long leash, as was the wont. Um, even in, in, in Christian families, um, people often in the ancient world just thought young men had to sort of do their thing. Um, and uh, so he tells us or really alludes to the fact that he was um, very active in this respect 
Strange thing is, is he actually doesn't go into detail about those sins. Perhaps, thankfully, maybe we don't want to hear too much about that. We don't want this text to be too X-rated. Um, but rather, he wants to tell us about this episode of stealing a pair. So a bunch of friends, and they, they sneak into uh, someone's yard and steal the pears. They don't want to eat them. They just want to steal them, and they actually waste what they've stolen. It's just for the thrill of doing something forbidden. And this, which, of course, many children do things like this, but for Augustine, this is the real sign of his depravity, right? It's not just that he is engaging in fornication. Actually, that for him is almost more explicable. Like, you, you want to be loved. You want acceptance. You want affirmation. You want affection, right? Um, and therefore, there's a, there's a good end that is being sought uh, in a less than good way. Here, the mystery of iniquity is at work because he's not stealing the pear to eat it. He's simply stealing it for the sake of stealing it. And he asks himself, what possible rationale is there for wickedness like that? Shame for its own sake, right? Wickedness for wickedness sake. That to him is really scary. To look in the mirror and see that you do evil things, not necessarily to get some good thing. Right? It's not that you're, you're hungry and you steal a loaf of bread because you want to sat satiate your hunger. Hunger's a bad thing. Eating's a good thing. The bread is good. It's good to eat, etc. Right? So, But the means whereby you acquire the bread, in this case, in that scenario, is the thing that is wrong. Here, the entire scenario is warped. Um, and so we're left with this intriguing kind of question, what's really the worst sin? What's the heinous sin? Is it the, the stealing or is it the fornication? And how do you know? How do you measure it? Is it by some extrinsic standard? Right? This is, well, okay, stealing pairs. Stealing is breaking one of the Ten Commandments, so is adultery. But generally, people don't think of stealing as as serious as, as fornication. Adultery, um, but for Augustine, it really is because it reveals the um, this this the the abysmal um, um, pathology, right, of the human condition. That, that this that we can't get to the bottom of it. There is this evil at work which does not explain itself, and yet, in retrospect, because of course he's telling this story after the fact, he finds rest in forgiveness. The grace right, given by God. I confess that everything has been forgiven, both the evil things I did of my own accord and those which I did not do because of your guidance. I chose this quote because I thought as doctors you would find it particularly um, particularly um, salient um, and, and um, inspiring. Right? Christ here is presented as the divine physician who seeks to heal us right? um, and to restore us from the sickness of sin. Sin is, of course, often, especially in the Christian West, um, theological tradition of the Western churches, presented in, in sort of forensic or legal terms. You're all familiar with the you know, courtroom metaphors that have been used to describe um, the breaking of a divine law and, 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 for example, the Christ presented as one who, who pays the debt or who, who accepts the punishment in our stead. And of course, the, the, that, um, that way of understanding soteriology or salvation is there in the scriptures, in the epistle to the Romans. But here, St. Augustine is tapping into something that we will see is actually very widespread in the early church, particularly in the Eastern churches, which is a, a therapeutic model, right? That sin is sickness, the human being suffers this disease, uh, and what we need is a um, compassionate healer um, to save us from ourselves. And what we need ultimately is to be raised from the dead. Right? We need eternal life is the only cure for the human condition. Book three, he is in Carthage as a student. And he begins with uh, an example that I find the students uh, are very interested in. Um, of course, we don't go to the theater that much. I mean, most of us don't, perhaps. Um, but we all consume a lot of um, 
theater, quote unquote, through uh, movies, um, television. Uh, and so the same question arises for Augustine. He asks himself why he goes to the theater and weeps over events which are not real, and then comes out seemingly cleansed, having experienced a kind of catharsis or an emotional uh, uh, emotional cleansing, um, but then is unable to actually have compassion for real people and their suffering. Um, and the, I invite the students to think about this is in fact cinema, movies, uh, television, uh, a kind of distraction which numbs the soul and prevents us from uh, relating to our fellow human beings as we ought. Or is there a positive account that could be given of such media? He also, in this period as a student, uh, is introduced to philosophy. And in light of philosophy, he sees the, the Christian scriptures as not so elegant, not so inspiring, not so noble. Um, he doesn't know what to do with the text, particularly with the stories of the Old Testament. Um, and he doesn't know how to interpret them in a way that would seem to him to be philosophically sophisticated. In this book, he concludes with the consideration of ethics. And this is one example where, uh, as I said before, Augustine is very important both for theological tradition as well as for the uh, philosophical tradition. Is justice relative or is it absolute? Is it contextual, that is, or is it perennial? The same principles apply everywhere and at all times or are ethics situational? If so, if the moral law is, that is, universal, how is it the case that God can allow certain things, say polygamy in the Old Testament, slavery, which are later forbidden? Um, does evil, evil is obviously a part of ethics, when people make unethical decisions, what's going on there? Is it, and this goes back also to what we were saying about the, the pair episode, is it simply me miss my misusing my freedom? Mm -hmm. Is it a, uh, uh, in that sense, a lack of good? So an almost an absence of something rather than the presence of something, or is there an actual evil in me in some way? And this is what the Manichaeans believed that evil was in matter and therefore in our very bodies, right? Um, and we might think that this is tr quite tricky to answer this because of course, in the New Testament, St. Paul will say, for example, um, you know, the thing I want to do, I do not do, but the thing and the thing, uh, the thing I do not want to do, I do, and the thing I do want to do, I do not do. What a wretched man am I, right? And he seems to blame himself for his own inability to do the good. And yet we have countless examples as well in the gospels of people possessed by demons who are doing evil things not at their own bidding, but at the bidding of an extrinsic exterior power, right? So that sin and, and, and evil are not easily assigned, it's not easy to assign them simply one place in the Christian understanding. Sometimes evil is a function of an external agent, and sometimes rather it is something that proceeds from within ourselves. This is a key idea of St. Augustine, however, his conclusion is that no evil really is nothing. It is this absence of good, an absence of, of, um, of something rather than uh, a presence in its own right. In uh, book four, he discusses how he got into, we might say, actually hung out with these people for a long time, almost over a decade. Um, the uh, religion which has recently emerged in the third century in Persia and made its way uh, into the Roman Empire. It was a kind of um, Gnosticism, you could say broadly speaking, called Manichaeism, uh, found, founded by a, a, a Persian prophet or self-proclaimed prophet named Mani. Um, and they practiced um, Things like reading the stars, they believed in a certain kind of fatalism um, that someone's uh, destiny was, was written in the stars and could be discerned by a person with uh, an educated eye to this end. Um, and uh, he looks back and says, yeah, I was, I was caught up in this and I just didn't realize how misguided it all was, right? Like I was just 
wandering in this in this confusion i was deluded because i thought these people were spiritual but in fact there was just there was lots of uh, heat and no light he goes on to speak about friendship this is a theme which recurs again and again throughout the text remember that i said augustine was somebody who who loved to be loved and it's his experience with a uh, friend's death, a friend who goes unnamed. That self is very interesting. He doesn't tell us the name of his friend. Uh, it is simply someone who he felt they were one soul in two bodies. And that in having loved this friend, he learns the hard way that life is full of suffering. And ask himself, as it were, is it worth it to love if you're going to suffer this much? This is something that, of course, many people face in life is the experience of suffering does it make is it does it, is love worth the risk is it better to have loved and lost as Shakespeare would have it than to not have loved at all book five is something of a, a turning point within the autobiographical section augustine is still fascinated with the manichees and particularly with the impending visit of their of a charismatic Manichaean uh, leader named Faustus. He meets up with this Faustus and finds that this guy is not what he was cracked up to be. And so in, uh, decides to practice a bit of social distancing, um, even though there was no pandemic that required it. So he leaves to pursue job prospects, somewhat disillusioned with his experience with the Manichaeans, and he thinks he'll find something better somewhere else. So he goes to Italy um, to pursue a career as a court orator, somebody who would make speeches uh, on behalf of those in authority, uh, representing them to uh, the masses. There he meets St. Ambrose, and St. Ambrose is able to actually deal with, he has the, you know, the, the, the and the holiness to deal with the, the, the weeds that it were that are in Augustine's mind because of his time with the Manichees. The Manichees had taught him, and we can't go into this in detail, but it's basically two powers in the universe, two equal powers that are always at war with one another. Uh, and part of their teaching was that the God of the Old Testament was not the same as the God of Jesus Christ, right? That there was sort of an evil God and a good God, evil and, and good power at, at war with one another. Um, and that was how one account, they accounted for the things in the Old Testament that were difficult to rationalize from an ethical point of view, right? Um, polygamy, slavery, genocide, and other things, war, holy war. So Augustine is, um, even if he is disenchanted with the Manichees per se, he is, doesn't know what to do with, what he, with their critique of um, Christian faith. But now he meets someone who is equal to Faustus. This is St. Ambrose, who can interpret the scriptures in a way that is convincing to St. Augustine. And part of what was going on there is, is Ambrose, like many of the church fathers, gives a spiritual interpretation, a figure, figurative interpretation of many of the texts of the Old Testament. We see this way of interpreting already with St. Paul in Galatians, where he talks about Hagar and Sarah as figures of two covenants and two mountains. Hmm? And he says it's an allegory, right? The child of the slave woman, the child of the free woman. It doesn't mean that St. Paul believes that there was no real Hagar, or real Sarah, but rather the import, the import, the, the significance of that passage for Christians was not just in, and not even predominantly, pre preeminently, in the human figures, but in what they symbolized. So uh, St. Ambrose is able to sort of speak about many of the events in the Old Testament in this way, uh, in, in, in how they point to um, things that will be fulfilled in the gospel. And therefore, Augustine comes to realize that, hold on, this, this Christianity is intellectually defensible. So he agrees to become a catechumen, that is someone who is a learner, um, who, someone who is committing themselves to prepare for baptism, although um, he does not yet undergo baptism. At that time, it was a fairly lengthy process. One was expected to demonstrate a certain conversion of, of mores, a, a holiness of life, even prior to um, uh, becoming a member of the church. 
although as a catechumen, to be fair, one could was entitled to a Christian burial and therefore at some level was considered part of the church. Baptism by desire, we might say. If you died as a catechumen without being baptized, you were considered to have um, been baptized by desire. Now, Augustine is uh, persuaded by the gospel to a certain extent, places himself under St. Ambrose's tutelage. Uh, and again, we see here this image of uh, the physician, right? The, the, the righteous pastor, a holy bishop who is like a doctor who knows how to um, minister to the ailing soul. Augustine looks back and realizes, you know, I was just once bitten twice shy. I knew I needed to believe, but I was afraid of being deceived. Didn't want to find myself in a situation, he's saying, with the Christians that was like what I found when I was with the Manichees, right? You didn't want to go from being in a cult, one cult into another, we might say. Therefore, um, was jaded. Part of what edges him along is the, not just the ministry of St. Ambrose, but the, but the witness of his friends, right? He's, his friends around him in, in different ones go through their own conversions. Uh, and so there's something of a kind of a communal effect, communal dimension to the Christian witness that eventually brings him to the tipping point. Book seven is kind of curious. You could probably skip over it if you didn't have time to read the entirety of the autobiographical section. Not much happens in terms of the narrative of his life. But what's happening is all on the inside. Augustine takes a break, as it were, from telling us about what was happening on the outside to tell us about what was going on inside his, his mind and heart um, and how he was wrestling with um, intellectual questions that had been with him now for a long time. How to know God, how to see God. Can you see God, right? Um, and you would say, well, of course you can't see God. Well, the Manichees believed that God was actually a kind of matter, a kind of light that was disseminated throughout the created world. Um, so that in fact could, when you saw light, you saw God. Um, so he's trying to figure out how to how to think about God in a way that doesn't reduce God to um, a physical being, even something that is ephemeral, that is uh, ethereal, like like air um, or light. Um, he's he wants to understand whether God is to be thought of even in those terms, or rather to be thought of in terms that um, are not reducible to uh, to to finite proportions. Where does evil come from, and where does he go to find these questions? inside himself through prayer, meditation, reflection, study, or outward to learning from others. He reads these books of the Platonists, and I've referred to the Neoplatonic schema, the Exodus and the Veritus at the beginning of the lecture. Uh, and in these Platonic texts, he finds great wisdom, right? Um, he finds that, okay, God is in fact not a creature. He's not a, a uh, physical being, um, and the data of the senses, they give us metaphors wh whereby we can uh, speak of God, but they do not give us, in fact, uh, an actual understanding in, in, their, in their own right, right? Um, and therefore the Manichees are mistaken. God is not this uh, substance. God is transcendent literally beyond space and time. The, you know, the Greek root of the word transcendent means climbing beyond, right? Um, paradoxically, you, you, you can't speak about something transcendent without immediately seeming to make it not transcendent, right? Because if it's truly transcendent beyond space and time, you can't speak of it, except by saying that you can't speak of it, right? Uh, and so Augustine says, aha, so God is, is transcendent, he is not within the system, right? But he holds all things in being. And of course, in the incarnation, he enters into the system. This system for the Neoplatonists is subject to corruption. Everything is changing. Everything is dying. Right? It's the nature of things to come into being and to pass away. So God, if he's not part of the system, has to be the one who is not subject to this processes of, of decay. He is immutable, incorruptible. Right, as well as being invisible and incomprehensible. 
see how ph important philosophical terminology is here. These words that have in Latin, English, uh, the prefix in or im suggest a negation of something, right? You can't understand, incomprehensible. You can't see, invisible, right? You can't behold, like ineffable, right? Um, and so God is in that sense known almost like through a via negativa, through what he is not. However, that God who, what God is, which is known through philosophy, does not tell us who God is. And this he returns to the scriptures. It's in the gospel that we find out who God is, what his character is. Right? And the, the, the Neoplatonists could not tell him about the incarnation. They did not know or believe in Jesus Christ. But the gospel tells of the one whose logos takes on flesh in order to reveal himself to us and to save us. Book eight, we hear about the birth pangs of his conversion. This is also an extremely famous book, like book two, because most people have heard about this moment where, and it's beautifully structured and very intentionally structured to kind of evoke um, you know, biblical parallels and parallels within the text as well. So he has his fall through the stealing of the pears at one tree, and now he is beneath another tree, a fig tree, Think of the biblical allusions there, of Nathaniel beneath the fig tree, right? Um, and there he comes to his senses. He goes into his house, right? And in his house, he goes into the garden. In the middle of his garden, the middle of his own home, he enters into the, his inner house, his soul, and there is able to return to the divine home. He hears a child's voice saying, take up and read, tole lege. And the passage that the Bible falls open to is uh, the, the epistles of St. Of Paul is what he had actually, not a whole Bible. Uh, what it sort of, the wind, as it were, blows it open. And he sees this passage, his eyes land upon this passage. Let us conduct ourselves properly as in the day, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in promiscuity and licentiousness, not in rivalry and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the desires of the flesh. So here he hears the Lord saying, look, you, it's not just about your understanding. You actually have to change your lifestyle. That is what is holding you back. Right? And this is a guy who was the life of the party, loved to party, loved to be loved. And now he realizes the particular um, path he has to walk if he is going to actually follow through on this moment of conversion. Wings are won by the freer shoulders of men who have not been exhausted by their searching and have not taken 10 years or more, so I'm sorry, that should be or more, to meditate on these matters. It is the Lord who converts Augustine to himself. Remember, we've heard about God chasing Augustine, as it were, not least through the, the, the prayer and the, um, <laughs> the badgering of his mother, uh, which has been with him throughout his life, and these other people who God has brought into his life to help him, um, help him come to faith. Here we also hear about um, uh, Augustine's visit to a fellow named Simplicianus, um, spiritual father of Saint Am uh, Bishop Ambrose, mm -hmm. who tells about another fellow named Victorinus, who had a very dramatic conversion as well, well a very public conversion. And then even a, a, on top of that, Augustine will need his friends Olypius and the Bridius to urge him to proceed and they will tell him about another fellow named Ponticianus, who himself was inspired to his convert in his conversion by reading the life of St. Anthony, the first monk. This was a fourth century text written by St. Athanasius of Alexandria in Egypt and had already become a bestseller in Augustine's day, telling about how St. Anthony renounces the world and goes out and, um, and is to meet God in the solitude of the desert. And so he has all these sort of you know, people around him kind of you know, you know, pushing him to kind of make that leap of faith. The thing I want to draw your attention to um, that I think many people miss in this text is what we learn about sort of the public life of the church in this period. Um, Victorinus has a conversion, like Augustine. He has a turning, as the word means, to God. 
Um, but that's not, that's just the beginning, it's not the end. He has to, in fact, be welcomed into the community of the church. And therefore, he has to go through these uh, stages, be instructed in the mysteries of the faith, submit his name for baptism, have other people vouch for his character, and then at Easter, make a public profession of the faith through the Apostles' Creed, which was the creed used in the West uh, for uh, at baptism. In the East, they were using the Nicene Creed, the longer creed, um, which was also used in the West in the context of the Eucharist. In book nine, we could come to the end of the autobiographical section, and Augustine has told his story. Of course, his much life, much of his life is yet to transpire, but it's the end of his story in the sense of the it's the end of the story of his wandering. Everything hereafter is the story of his ministry, and he feels that that's already well known to people. Right? In that sense, his baptism, his second birth is the completion of the story that began with his physical birth. He meets his mother, who was the one who was always praying for him and to whom he accredited his conversion. And in returning to, in meeting with his mother, who had, had wept when he left her behind, actually tricked her, very, not a very nice son. He had tricked her and went, when he went off to Italy and not told her where he was going because he was worried she would follow after him, which she actually did anyways. But he comes to meet his mother now on equal terms as a sister, as, as, as brother and sister in Christ, not just as mother and son. And in that sense, coming to his home to his earthly mother is sort of like a figure of returning to his spiritual mother of the church. Now they are together as children in the church. And they have this mystical experience, he describes, um, on the beach which you can't put into words other than to say that they are caught up together in the spirit. Uh, and that's, that's what we're left with. He has this encounter with God. It's like everything has come full circle and everything that needs to be told about his journey has now been told. Interestingly, we hear some other details about the liturgical life or the worship practices of the church in his day. And it's just interesting to know, uh, again, you don't have to agree with these things, but to, to know that these things were being done already in St. Augustine's day. People were singing psalms. This was a practice that St. Augustine, St. Ambrose had introduced into the church, St. Augustine says, after the practice of the Eastern churches where it began, singing psalms in church. Um, veneration of martyrs' relics, that is the shrines or tombs of those who had given their life for Christ, and prayer for the dead, because Augustine tells us that Monica asked that the only thing she wanted to be done after she died was that people remember her at the altar of the Lord, that they pray for her. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on books 10, 11, 12, and 13 uh, tonight, simply because we're getting close to the end of our time, and they are very rich, but very, very complex. I will just say a few things about book 10 and then summarize books 11 to 13 on the next slide. Here we have a dramatic shift of genre. Book 10 is twice as long as any of the other books and a completely different style of writing. He's not talking about his life so much anymore, but about life, right? How do we recall? How do we do the kind of thing that he just did? How do we possess and exercise this power of memory? Where does our life come from? And how do we... Um, how do we make sense of it, given that we're always passing from the past into the present, even yearning for the future? Time never stands still, and Augustine's not the first nor the last, but he's certainly one of the most important people to have meditated on this, this mystery of time, um, that we are able to remember things that, have, that no longer exist, and therefore to have a sense of being stretched out or having continuity of our own being in time. We don't just live in the moment. And indeed, when someone just lives in the moment and forgets things, the next moment, we, we, we call that a pathology, right? If somebody has amnesia, right? Or is uh, some other type of psychological disorder and is not able to remember the things that they said and did. So that has an impact on their ability to um, maintain a sense of self and for other people to maintain that as well. So Augustine is deeply intrigued by this, um, this mystery of selfhood, which is in one sense something so obvious because we take it for granted. Um, and yet when you stop to look at it, it's really quite wondrous. And for him, God is present, revealing us to ourselves. Remember book one, where he was saying, 
how can I tell you about my life when I need to learn who I am from you? Books 10, 11, 12, and 13 uh, unfold a commentary on Genesis. And remember what I said about the spiritual interpretation of scripture with St. Ambrose. This is a spiritual interpretation of Genesis. All sorts of things in there that you might have thought of if you follow you know, debates about you know, religion and science and nature of human origins. You've probably anticipated some of what he'll talk about. So the nature of nothing. How does something come from nothing? Is there some type of primordial matter from which order then emerges and so forth? But there's lots of things which I'm certain most of us have not encountered until we read a text like this. Augustine sees the opening chapters of Genesis as a parable for the life of the church. Right? Uh, and that the creation of the world foreshadows the recreation of all things in Christ um, and in the life of the church. And so he sees much more in there than most people would see. It's not just a cosmogony or an account of the creation of the world, but this, there's a spiritual meaning or set of spiritual meanings. And indeed, he, th he thinks that there's multiple possible meanings for a number of passages. And it becomes a bit of a case study in how we um, wrestle over the meaning in scripture and derive a blessing like Jacob by engaging with others who disagree with us and, fi and finding out how, you know, how many meanings can be held together, as it were, in, in, in one reading. Uh, a text can be polyvalent, po polysemous, right? Um, have, have multiple levels of meaning. Um, and that is a sign that the text is truly divine because it bears more than can be reduced to any one, uh, any one human being's um, understanding. So I invite you to read these probably on its own, actually, at some point. Um, if you're reading Confessions, you can take a break after chapter nine, book nine. You probably want to take a break after book 10, and then you can read books 11, 12, and 13, really uh, this, this, as I say, case study in hermeneutics, in the art of interpretation uh, on, uh, when you're in the mindset to do so. In conclusion, um, St. Augustine has been called by, by some people the father of modern psychology. Why? Because he studies the self. And in studying himself and the nature of the self, he gives us tools to explore our own selves. Um, through a careful observation of ourselves, we can see um, the Lord working in our lives and in the lives of others. The Lord who works in and through history. Um, not something so much that Augustine would accredit to the uh, tribute to the Neoplatonists, but something that emerges very clearly uh, in the Christian faith, in and through the narrative of scripture in which God works through people um, to work out his purposes, and often very fallen people, fallen just like Augustine. I have a number of um, quotes from the text, um, which I, uh, which Corey will share with you on a separate sheet. Uh, and then with each of those quotes, I have a number of discussion questions. So I invite you to um, read those quotes, even if you haven't read the entirety of the Confessions or even any part of it, so you read the quotes. And I think that those quotes speak for themselves and the questions are questions that everyone could be interested in, even if they haven't had a chance to read the text. And I look forward to seeing you all uh, next um, Thursday when we'll have a chance to discuss these things together. Let us conclude in prayer. This is a beautiful prayer of St. Augustine to the Holy Spirit. We actually sing this uh, in the classes. I sing this in the classes at the college with the students. Today we'll just, uh, just recite this. Breathe in me, O Holy Spirit, that my thoughts may all be holy. Act in me, O Holy Spirit, that my work too may be holy. Draw my heart, O Holy Spirit, that I love but what is holy. Strengthen me, O Holy Spirit, to defend all that is holy. Guard me then, O Holy Spirit, that I always may be holy. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, everyone, for your attention, for tuning in to uh, this recording, and I look forward to uh, seeing you all next week. God bless.